several weeks ago in one of my sermons, I used a quote by Brene Brown. And after using that, I've been kind of intrigued by some of her writings lately. And what intrigues me is the fact that her writings, her research, the, the focus of that is on shame. And through social science, many of the things that she's been unearthing in that research are really deeply biblical. But she's never really looked at it that way, and a lot of people who look at her research haven't seen it that way either. But she starts out every article, every talk, every chapter in her book with these same three facts. First, we all have shame. Second, we're all afraid to talk about it. And third, the less we talk about it, the more control it has over our lives. So I thought for this new sermon series, let's talk about it. Let's talk about shame and, and first what it means for what makes us feel ashamed. And she, in her research, she asked people, what makes you ashamed? And some of the examples she was given was shame of getting laid off and having to tell my pregnant wife. Shame is, ha is having somebody ask you when you're due, when you're not pregnant. Shame is hiding the fact that you're in recovery. Shame is raging at your kid. Shame is bankruptcy. Shame is my boss calling me an idiot in front of a client. Shame is not making part. Shame is my husband leaving me for the next door neighbor. Shame is my wife asking me for a divorce and telling me that she wants to have kids, just not me. Shame is a DWI. Shame is infertility. Shame is telling my fiance that my father lives in France when in fact he's in prison. Shame is internet pornography. Shame is flunking out of school twice. Shame is hearing my parents fight through the door and wondering if I'm the only one that feels this way. What would you add to that list? What would be shame for you in your personal life? You see, then there's this darkest type of shame of all, and, it, and it's really not even shame that you should feel, but it's shame that some people feel for what was actually done to them. When someone is actually a victim, but they still feel the shame for how they were victimized. And instead of the realization that the shame belongs on the perpetrator, they take it onto themselves as the victim. So for them, shame is being sexually abused. Shame is being raped. Shame is being bullied. And that's sad because that shouldn't be shame, at least not for them. Now, it would be easy to confuse shame with other feelings that we have. The most common one to confuse it with is guilt. But there's a big difference between those two. And the simplest way I've heard to describe it is to say that guilt is saying, I did bad. Whereas shame is saying, I am bad. See the difference there? The big difference between I made a mistake, which is guilt, and I am a mistake, which is shame. You see, guilt can be good when it's operating the way that it should. It's kind of like an internal alarm system that's telling us that we're not living the life that God wants us to live. We're not living his plan A for our life. And guilt works through our emotions to let us know I'm not supposed to be doing this. That internal warning system. And that can be a really healthy thing. But there's bad guilt, of course. Just like there's good guilt. But the good guilt is something that we need. And let's be honest, not all shame 
is bad either. This is good shame, particularly a collective community shame that reinforces certain behaviors. You know, that collective shame that we think about that's attached to deadbeat dads, child predators. So there can be, in fact, good shame. But the vast majority of shame that we take upon ourselves is not healthy. And the Bible talks about shame belonging to those who actually hurt the church's reputation. I like how, I'll paraphrase Paul, but I like how he writes this letter to a church and he says, okay, let me see if I've got this right. There are two of you in the church who have a disagreement. And instead of working it out like Christians, you decided to take each other to court. Is that really what's happening? And he tells them, you're bringing shame onto the church as a result of this public right? You see, when guilt evolves into destructive, self-hating shame, the sense that I didn't just do that, but that I am that. That's when we're getting into bondage. That God so desperately wants to release us from. And yet that's exactly where some of us, maybe even most of us, are today. Enslaved by our shame. Not I made a mistake, but that I am a mistake. And we can't seem to separate that from ourselves. We can't seem to get the fact that the Bible actually gives us a balance. You know, in one of the most famous verses in Romans, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the truth of what I do. The source of good and authentic guilt. We are I do bad things, you do bad things. I shouldn't deny that I do them. And I should feel appropriate guilt afterwards that drives me to seek forgiveness and life change. But in, this is what's critical. While I am, while I did bad, I am not bad. Because the Bible also says in Psalms, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm precious in God's sight. So if you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not simply forgiven. You are declared a son or a daughter. So don't confuse shame and guilt. Don't let guilt lead you into wrongful, destructive shame. And I know that's easier said than done. But that's the road that you don't want to head down. You see, this is what lies at the heart of the destructive forces there. And it's been that way from the very beginning. We read in the book of Genesis, how God created a paradise for Adam and Eve. And he said, it's all yours. The beauty, the pleasure, the wonderment of all that I've created. Run free, play, enjoy, create, eat from any tree, drink from any stream, stream just not that tree. You must not eat from the tree of the knowledge and of good and evil. Why was that? Why did God set aside that one and only one tree that they couldn't eat from? You see, it's actually something that lies at the heart of our relationship with Jesus. God created an opportunity, a choice, to make sure that the relationship between Him and us is really going to be just that, a relationship. And that is going to be something that they either chose to be into, chose to honor, willingly gave themselves to that relationship. And it didn't have to be a tree that he set aside. It could have been anything in all reality. But it was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because it represented the decision as to whether they were going to determine good and evil for themselves 
or to follow God in that area. They had a choice. They could do what God said, obey Him, honor Him, or they could determine for themselves what was good and evil for themselves. They could be their own God. So the choice was not just about whether to obey, but whether or not to continue to be in a relationship with God. So what was life like in that perfect state in Eden? One where they chose well, lived free, and they experienced paradise. I like how Genesis 3 puts it. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Think about that. Because it's kind of fascinating to think about. Of all the things that could have been said to summarize life in the Garden of Eden, it was that they were shame-free. I mean, it could have said they were happy and fulfilled. They were joyful and at peace. They were all Red Wings fans. But that's not what it said. It said that they were both naked and felt no shame. It seems a little bit odd, doesn't it? But it's not. You see, that's the most important observation that could have been made. Naked wasn't about clothing. It was much more than that. It means that they were completely open, completely honest with each other, completely vulnerable and accepting of each other. There were no barriers between them and God, and between themselves. And as a result, there was no shame. And that's the way that God meant it to be. That's the way God wanted it to be, and that's the way he created it to be. Which tells us just how powerful living unashamed is, and how deadly shame can be. But then they made that dreadful choice. We see it in chapter 3. She took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover them. That has been the nature of human experience ever since. Screwing up, letting the guilt of that morph into some sort of destructive shame, and then doing whatever it is that we can think of to cover up our shame. And there's a couple of things that Adam and Eve did right off the bat that we still do to this day. The first thing they did They hid. We see that continuing. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Now, of course, we know we can't actually hide from God. And even when we read that God asked Adam and Eve where they were, it wasn't like he didn't know where they were. He asked that question because he wanted to draw them out. He wanted to pull them out, and he wanted to deal with them relational. But they didn't want to be drawn out. They wanted to hide. They wanted to hide from God, from the truth, and in a way, from themselves. But that's not all. Not only did they want to hide from the very one who could help them, not only did they let shame take hold and try to cover it up, but they also tried to discharge all of that pain and discomfort that they were feeling by shaming others. 
And we see that right away from Adam. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked? Have you eaten from the tree of whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? And the man replied, It was the woman you gave me who, who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. You get the instant blame game. God asked Adam, Did you do what I told you not to do? And he doesn't say yes or no. He doesn't say maybe, possibly. He doesn't say true, what's true? I don't know what you're talking about. In fact, he doesn't even answer the question at all. Instantly he says, it's her. It's her fault. She gave it to me. And if that weren't enough, he then said, God, it's actually your fault. Because you're the one who gave it to me. It's the woman you put here. It's your fault. So not only was it Eve's fault, he now said it's even God's fault. Anybody but Adam. But Eve could learn the blame game just as well as anyone else. And she does the exact same thing. When God turns to her, she goes, it's a snake. Not me, it's a snake. And of course, who created the snake? So what does blaming others do for us? Well, here's what we think it does for us. We think that it somehow lessens our sense of shame. As if the more that I shame you, the better I'll feel about myself. So we have mommy shaming, fat shaming, online shaming, all these different kind, types of shame out there. But how did God respond? How did he respond to that shame? Did he say, third, you're right. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Live in it, wallow in it, let it eat away at your soul. Obviously, that's not what he did. But what God did next might surprise us. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. In the midst of their sin and shame, right after they did it, God tenderly made them clothing. As one writer put it, Adam and Eve needed clothing because sin had opened their eyes to their nakedness. But God gives them clothing because his eyes are opened with compassion to the shame that now exists in them because of sin. There's even more. The animal skins could not have been made without those animals being killed, sacrificed. The very first time that anything had ever been killed for the sake of another. Already at the very beginning, a picture of the ultimate sacrifice that we made in the person of Jesus. A sacrifice that would clothe our shame completely and find it. The most important thing that God did it wasn't to make them close. It was to meet them at their point of need. To meet them at their point of shame. To have them be vulnerable in the midst of their sin. And in that vulnerability to receive the healing that they needed. To own the good guilt. But also to reject the false shame. You see, as guilty people, we need forgiveness. As shamed people, we need community, love, and acceptance. Yet left to itself, shame will turn us away from others and away from God, rather than moving us toward God and toward other people. So what does God do when we're hiding and we're blaming and we're wanting to run away because of our shame, when what we really need is to be running to Him. God responds to our shame by drawing us out of it and into a community with Him first and then with others. You see, that's the antidote to shame, the vulnerability, 
and transparency. Bringing our sin out into the open, where it can be met with grace and acceptance, with God and with others. But we don't deal well with vulnerability, do we? Because becoming vulnerable means opening ourselves up to potentially being wounded. But we don't like that. Brene Brown asked people to fill in this sentence. Vulnerability is blank. And some of the replies that she got was, vulnerability is sharing an unpopular opinion, standing up for myself, asking for help, saying no, initiating sex with my wife, initiating sex with my husband, calling a friend whose child just died, the first date after my divorce. Saying I love you first and not knowing whether they're going to say it in return. Getting fired. Waiting for the biopsy to come back. Exercising in public, especially when you don't know what you're doing and you're out of shape. Admitting that you're afraid. Asking for forgiveness. Now here's what's interesting about that for us. Most of us tend to think that vulnerability is a weakness. But the examples I just read, do they sound like weaknesses? Or do they sound like somebody who's telling the truth and has courage to step out and faith? You see, what's fascinating about her research is that when people start to say that vul what vulnerability is, they would say things that sound like weaknesses. But in reality, is truth and courage. But that's not how we feel about it. And one word kept coming up over and over again to describe what vulnerability feels like. And it's interesting because that one word is naked. Like being on stage naked and hoping for applause rather than laughter. I guess it's not their thing. Vulnerability is being naked when everyone else is fully clothed. Before shame entered the world, nakedness was fine. Nakedness was good. It was the vulnerability that resulted in truth and courage. But then sin entered the picture, and with it, shame. And then nakedness wasn't good anymore. And with it, vulnerability suddenly became bad. You see, shame makes us turn away from people and turn away from God instead of toward people and toward God. So we need to get back to the garden on this. We need to develop a healthy vulnerability with others as, as if we're going to get past our shame. You see, the heart of our shame is having something to hide. Something about us that isn't enough, that we feel would result in rejection. It's not being good enough, not being perfect enough, not being thin enough, not being powerful enough, successful enough, smart enough. The heart of shame is believing that who we are, the flaws, the mistakes, the failures, the habits, and our appearance, makes us unworthy of love and belonging. Which is why if we can share our story with someone who responds with empathy and understanding, shame can't survive. And even though she didn't know it, Brene Brown was describing the way that God wants his community of people to be with each other. Safe people who can respond to what is shaming us, or what we feel is shaming us, with empathy, grace, acceptance, restoration, and love. You see the vicious cycle that we are stuck in? Instead of letting guilt drive us to seek forgiveness, we let it drive us to shame. And then once we're engulfed in that chain, we hide from both God and from others. 
And then we vomit out even more shame on everyone else around us as we try to make ourselves feel better. It's a sick cycle that we need to break. But the one thing we need to do is to come out into the earth. And with that, we're feeling vulnerable. When we do that, we're at a place where we can be met with forgiveness and healing, restoration, grace, acceptance, and support. And when we do so, we again can be those people who are fearful and wonderful names and who are precious to God. Can we be those kind of people? Can we be vulnerable with each other? Can we handle someone being vulnerable with us? And can we be safe in return to them? It's not easy. It can be messy. But it is always beautiful and good. Because it's being authentic, one of our core values here. It's being real. It's being in a place where you are allowed to be real. In the classic children's book, The Velveteen Rabbit, the main character is this stuffed rabbit, all clean and new, who becomes real. And during the process, he meets this old, worn-out, very much loved stuffed horse. One of their conversations kind of stood out to me. What is real? asked the rabbit one day, when they were laying side by side near the nursery fender, before Nana came in to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside of you in a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time. Not just a play, but really loves you. Then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? Doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen, doesn't often happen to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off. Your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But those things don't matter at all. Because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except the people who don't understand. You never get real. Not like that when you hide. When you refuse to be vulnerable, when you refuse that kind of love, when naked only means one thing, a terror or a nightmare. And it reminds me of something I read about the childhood game of hide and seek. You see, there's only one problem with the game of hide and seek. There's only that one kid who hit too well. And you could never find him. And eventually you gave up. And eventually he came back all mad because you stopped looking for him. And then you get mad at him because he hit too well. That's not the point of the game. The point of the game is to be found. And there was this man who had terminal cancer. And he didn't want to make his family and friends suffer through his illness. So he kept it a secret. Eventually he died. And everybody said how brave he was to bear his suffering in silence and not to tell everyone. But his family and friends, they didn't feel that. They were angry that he didn't feel as if he needed them, or he didn't trust their strength. It hurt them beyond words that he didn't even say goodbye. In the end, that man hid too well. And that's why God says to every single one of us, Ali Ali Oxen for you. Come on in wherever you are. It's a new game. Hide and go seek is over. It's time to be found. 
And when we do that, we'll find something amazing, which we're going to explore in the second part of this sermon series. And we're going to find out about what happens when we come clean with our shame. What happens when God takes that shame away from us? And it's a God who never says, shame on you, but only says, shame off of you. And wants, to, wants that desperately for our lives. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for what you did in the garden for Adam and Eve. That when they wanted to hide, that when they wanted to feel shame, that you loved them anyway. That you accepted them. And Lord, help each of us here today be willing to be vulnerable when we struggle. And help those of us to be willing to accept those who are vulnerable and to return to them love and acceptance. And God, that sacrifice that you made on that cross so many years ago. Thank you for the fact that through that one single action, you open the doorway for us to come back into a relationship with you and to never feel shame again. In your son's name. Amen. Mm -hmm.